Good morning, everybody. Let's all stand and let's get ready to sing. Put those hands together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what I say. done and how he can continue to use us because of his good work. Amen. Lord, I come with newfound faith, trusting every word you say. Lord, I come with newfound faith. I will trust every word you say. All my fears I'm laying down at your
Lord, I come with willing hands. Use my life to fulfill your plan. All I have, I give to you and offer it. Cause you are who you are. Amen. You know, we have that assurance, right? We have that assurance that all things are possible with Him. We have the assurance also that God is with us, regardless of if we're having a great day or a wonderful day or a bad day or a not-so-great day. This verse remains true. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from what a blessing to know that our God is with us regardless. Let's sing this together. You're always moving in the unseen, knowing that confidence that we have in Him. You're always moving in the unseen. breath you exhale sustaining me before I call, before I call you know my need you're always going before me you're always going before I'm confident your faithfulness will see me through. My soul can rest, my righteousness is found in you. With every moment left, with every moment left, and every borrowed breath 
let this be true. Of your faithfulness, I'm confident your faithfulness will see me through. My soul can rest, my righteousness is found in you. With every moment left, with every moment left. Breath, let this be true. Let all my heart for all my life belongs to you. Can't win the battle or wrong. And I won't win this battle with the strength of my own hand. You're the mountain mover, and only you can. I won't build my life on sinking sand. You're my hope forever, the rock where I stand. Sing again. I won't win this battle with the strength of my own hands. You're the mountain mover, and only you can. I won't build my life on sinking sand. You're my hope forever. The rock where I stand. The rock where I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. My soul can rest, my righteousness is found in you. We give everything to him. With every moment left and every borrowed breath, 
let this be true. Let all my heart for all my life belongs to you. Let all my heart for all my life belongs to you. Let all my heart for all my life belongs to you. Let's, uh, let's take a moment right now, all of us. Those words are so powerful concerning our commitment to Jesus. Understand that he is faithful and always giving us what we need, amen? amen. And we, in turn, our desire, our strength, our hope, our what we want, it all comes from Him. And that our, our desire would grow every day to give ourselves to Him. Everything, right? Everything, everything. Let's take a moment and just individually let God know that we want to give Him our lives. Thank you, Jesus. We are grateful. We want to give everything to you. Every action, every word, every thought, everything held captive by you, corrected by you, strengthened by you, provided by you, taught by you, everything, Jesus how we treat others, how we treat our family, how we treat the, our, the people we work with, the people we go to school with, how we treat our neighbors, even our enemies, Lord, even those against us, how we treat them. God, that we would do what you ask us to do. We would walk in confidence, unafraid, not worried. We would walk in confidence and assuredness knowing, Jesus, that you have given us your presence, your Holy Spirit. And God, when we don't know what to do, when we are unsure, God, we can still move ahead knowing that you will be faithful and you will provide what we need. Amen? Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? Amen. God, we give you praise. Let's give him praise. So good to be together. We're going to... We're going to take a moment here, and we're going to uh, work on this new song together. And this is what's exciting about a new song, all right? It's a new song to us. Maybe you've heard it already somewhere else. But this is what's great about a new song. A new song indicates that God is doing work today again and again, that he's doing new work. That prompted somebody to, sing, to, to write a new song. So we're going to do that together. Can we learn a new song together? sound like you're okay with it that's good what I want to know is do you want to do it for real yeah all right we're gonna try to do this chorus here together all right we're gonna start with the with the with the uh, lower end first praise the Lord oh my soul you repeat with me here we go Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Do it again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. All right, good job again. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. All right, good job. Now talk to your neighbor, tap, tap them on the shoulder, say, hey, you did a good job. All right, now you're all encouraged. Excellent. Okay, now, for those who like to sing higher, we're going to go. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. All right, try it again. Here we go. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. One more time. All right. Praise the 
Lord, oh my soul. Again, here we go. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. All right, good. I can hear you. I even hear Manny back there. He is like shouting it out as loud as he can. Good job, man. All right, you ready to do this? Let's do it. Here we go. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise in the valley. And praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. And I'll praise when I'm doubting. When I'm numbered. I'll praise when I'm numbered. And praise when surrounded. No fear, no worry. Cause praise is the water. My enemies drown.
but we're going to do this, okay? All right, we got two sides of this room. We got the left, my left, and we got the right, okay? So when I, when I put this microphone out there, I want to hear who is going to be louder. Can we do this? Is this okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Okay, here we go. I think they weren't ready. Okay, here we go. Let's do it again. Here we go. One, two, three, and praise the Lord, oh my soul. One, two, three. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, man. Okay. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. All right, together. Here we go. Praise. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you today. Blessings to you. I trust you've had a wonderful week. I say this quite often when I have the opportunity to kind of welcome everybody and do what I'm doing right now. Uh, I, you know, the, the, week, the week that was is done. So I don't know what that week looked like for you. It was, uh, we had a, I had a good week. It was a week of relaxation this past week. But I, I found out something. Um, even when you, 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 you get away for a little bit and you, and you kind of try and get refreshed, a couple of things happen. Life goes on. Yeah. You've ever noticed, have you ever noticed that? This life goes on. Uh, in fact, and got a, got a phone call from one of my students years and years ago in youth ministry. Uh, her family is just going through a tremendous amount of trauma. I mean, I can't, even, I can't even begin to describe everything that's going on. And then I get a, a voicemail from another person who was a part of our youth ministry years, this has been, been out of youth ministry since 1988, so it tells you a little, it's been a few years, right? These are now, these are now adults and grandpas and grandmas and so forth and so on, right? Um, that one of my, he was one of my students, 
just incredible physical difficulties. Uh, and then I got word last night that one of my, my cousin passed away. Life goes on, doesn't it? it it's, life is relentless. It's relentless. And at times, the relentlessness of life can become overwhelming to us. I, I do understand that. I don't know how it might be in your life right now. It might be overwhelming, or at least feel that way. There may be physical things going on in your life right now that you're saying, I don't know how I'm going to get, I don't know what I'm going to do next. You might be looking at a future of tremendous uncertainty. You might have, as you look at life, you may say, you know something, I just have so many questions. I, I don't even know how to begin to answer those questions. I don't even know where to turn. I cannot tell you how powerful the last five minutes have been to overcome the relentlessness of life. Praise the Lord will do amazing things that nobody else can do. When you give God praise, it, it enlightens your life. It, it, it turns darkness to light. It takes away the, the stress, the difficulty. It returns joy into our soul that so much of life can just rip away. I'm grateful that we had a little competition this morning, <laughs> a little worship competition. It was awesome. That was so much fun. Martin, we got to do that again next week. Okay, there's the challenge. And if he doesn't do it, just give him a really bad time, okay? His email is martin at gotocrossroads.com. Just... <laughs> it is a delight for me to have the opportunity to welcome you. And if this is your first time with us, God bless you. Thank you for taking, a few, taking this weekend and, and joining with us in worship. We have a, a number of ways to connect, and we would love to have that opportunity. I can't tell you how important it is. I, I was looking at something this morning. I, I'm, not, I'm not preaching today. Tyler is, and so I want to give him the opportunity to preach. Okay? Yeah, I know. I'm excited. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need it. Exactly. I love, I was, I was thinking about this morning. I was so excited to hear what God's put on his heart, and I've looked at his notes, and it's going to be great. So get ready. It's going to be great. Uh, but I was looking at something this morning, and I remember what happened during COVID. There was such a disconnect that took place. Churches were disconnected, and people were disconnected from each other. And I want, I want us to be able to have that opportunity to connect. So if, if you would do us a, a great favor, and just you can fill out a connection card, you can do the digital connection card, whatever it may be, let us know. We want to keep that connection alive and just journey together faith believe that God's going to do great, great things in your life and through us together. You can also, the prayer request cards are so important to us, so please let us know how we can pray with you. And we're going to pray in a moment for your needs today. So connect with us. We would love that opportunity. Lots of good ways to do that. Immediately following the service, we have what's called Tech 10, and that's just 10 10 minutes or so, uh, hanging out with Marcy and me and the staff, and we're going to be in the cafe, and we're going to just chat a little bit about the church, who we are, why we do what we do, and just to have an opportunity to get acquainted. So come and join us. There's no lunch. There's nothing like that. It's just some information. It'll be real brief. It'll be on your way, and then you can get to wherever it is you can go. If you want to go to Chick-fil-A today, sorry, you can't do that. Okay, and Chick-fil-A is taking the day off. But you can go have lunch. But come and join us for just a few moments. Also, beginning this week, for the next two weeks on Wednesday evening, is New Believers class. And we had, a, we had a whole bunch of folks who said, yes, I want to follow Christ or making rededication, recommitments to Christ on Easter. Can I encourage you, two weeks, two weeks, two Wednesday nights, from 6.30 to 8.30, you can sign up at the, uh, at the Information Center this morning. Come and join us for just those two Session. You say, maybe you have questions about faith. Maybe you've been following Jesus a while, but you still have questions. Come and be a part of that. It's going to be a wonderful time together, a couple hours. And it will just begin this process of taking that next step of faith. And that is so important for all of our faith journeys. So come and join us right after this beginning, this Wednesday night, 6.30 for the next two weeks. There's another part of this that will come later during our life group semester. It will be a seven-week version of this, but this is a great way to begin that next steps process. 
Also, today is the last day to sign up for baptism. So if you would like to be baptized in water, please go to the Information Center and sign up and be a part of that. And then finally, May the 5th, May the 5th, May the 5th, Cinco de Mayo is going to be our church picnic. And no, we're not having tacos. We're having whatever you bring. So there you go. You can go get tacos later, all right? But we're going to have a good, our, our, it's a really wonderful time of fellowship. We just, we hang out at, uh, I'm here at the sports park, and it's just a blast. So it's a great time to be together, and it's a wonderful time to get connected and to get, oper have opportunities to meet new friends and family. All right. Thank you for your continued giving. God bless you. There's no way we could do what we do without you. It is a partnership that we share together in our giving that allows us to just even gather and meet as we are today. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. And if there are different ways to give, you can give online. That's the easiest way. You can set up an, a recurring gift. If that is something that works for you, it's a great blessing to us. But then also you can give online. You can give here with the envelopes provided in the drop boxes in the back. You can always mail your gift in. We're just appreciative of God's faithfulness through you. Remember, we don't give to the church. Okay, that's a, sometimes a misnomer. You don't give to the church. You give to the Lord. And when that is the attitude of our heart, everything changes. We're not giving to the church. We give to the Lord. And God will bless you more than I can even express as you continue to be generous before the Lord. And if you've not begun that generosity journey, I want to encourage you to do that. Start where you are. Begin to give. And God, I know, will bless you abundantly. Let's pray. And if you have a need this morning, just where you are, just lift your hand. Nobody's going to see that but the Lord, and he's just going to meet you where you are. Jesus, thank you today that we can be together. We are, we're in awe of your presence. I'm so grateful that you do restore our soul. And Lord, even though as, even as relentless as life is, <clears throat> I'm grateful that you are, you have not separated yourself from us. We're not isolated. We're not alone. We don't walk this journey alone. And sometimes we feel alone. I get it. I have felt that. But we don't walk this journey alone. You're with us. And you'll never forsake us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would encourage each heart, each mind, each spirit, each person to hear today in Jesus' name. And, Lord, if there are needs and there are those whose hands are lifted, we pray that if it is healing, we pray that you, Jehovah, Rafa, our healer, would do just that in our life. Exactly what is needed. In fact, not just what's needed. I pray that you would exceed those expectations in our life. I pray, Lord, for Lord, if there are questions, I, I pray that you would begin to answer those questions, everyone. Lord, you would put your, your spirit deep within our heart and give us a peace about the future. Whatever that might be, it may seem very uncertain. But, God, we commit it to you knowing you are more than able to, di to direct our every step. For that, we're grateful. And Lord, we pause for a moment and we pray for what is happening in the Middle East this morning. Lord, we pray that this conflict, Lord, would not escalate in the name of Jesus. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for peace in that region. And we pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit throughout that region of the world. And many would come to faith in Christ and would turn the tide, Lord, of the violence that has existed for so many centuries. Lord, you know you are the only one. We know you are the only one able to do that. So we commit in prayer today to, we ask today in prayer that you would do just that and even more. Now, Lord, we pray that you'd open up our hearts to what uh, God, you have put upon Tyler's heart through your word to speak into our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.
All right. How are you doing? You guys are like, there's a table on stage. There's not normally a table on stage. I don't know what to do with that. We'll talk about it in a second here. Uh, for those of you that don't know who I am, uh, I'm the guy that does announcements. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm the youth pastor here at uh, Crossroads. Excited to see what we're going to do this morning. Um, I'm honored to have been asked to join this series. Um, I think that I truly believe that there's many topics that the church um, quite honestly stays quiet about, uh, To and, and I don't like that, and I'm grateful to be a part of a church and leadership that is willing to face these things head on, talk about them, commit weeks to them. So uh, if you guys have not told uh, Pastor Gary and Marcy how grateful you are to have them as your senior pastors, then you need to do that today. Uh, because there are churches that these things are going on and they won't talk about them because they're afraid. Uh, but we believe that God wants to move in our lives and wants to move in your families. So I'm grateful to be able to step behind that and uh, help push that forward. So for those of you that don't know, we're in our second week of our series, Ancient Wisdom, Modern Family. And uh, Pastor spoke last week and did an incredible job. If you did not hear last week's message or you weren't here uh, you can just go ahead and stand up now and leave and listen to that message, <laughs> and uh, it'll be, no, seriously though, please listen to that message. It does lay a lot of the groundwork of what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks, so if you've not heard that message, please make sure that you listen to that. It's on your YouTube page and, and all that, so you can find it there. This series is all about exploring the ancient wisdom regarding family and how it interacts with the modern Family And the verse that we've been looking at kind of to base the series off of is Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 through 4. And it says, a house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. Now, there's a story about a little girl who uh, she's beginning to ask the questions that little kids do, that us parents try and figure out. We give them an answer and then we look it up later online to make sure we gave them the right answer. And she asked her mom, she says, mom, where did we come from? Like, where did we, like, not that question, but like, where did we come from? Okay. Not the, the question, but a question, a version of the question, we'll say. And she says, well, you know, God created Adam and Eve and he, they had kids and then they had kids and had kids and had kids. And then here we are. That's how we, that's how we came into existence. She's like, okay, makes sense. And then she goes to her dad, dad, where did we come from? He's like, well, you know, long ago there were monkeys, and then we evolved from the monkeys and became humans. That's, and she's, she, she's like, okay. And her, her, her mom could tell that she's frustrated not knowing what dad had just said, and she's like, what's wrong? And she's like, well, dad said we came from monkeys, and you said that God created Adam and Eve, and we came from them. And she's like, honey, your dad was just explaining his side of the family, and I was explaining <laughs> my side of the family. Right? There's dysfunction. There's some confusion in the house. And we're talking about the dysfunctional family this morning. Okay? Why the youth pastor is talking about dysfunctional family? Because I have your students in my ministry, so I know. <laughs> Just kidding. So according to Webster's Dictionary, dysfunction means impaired or abnormal functioning. Dysfunctional means abnormal or unhealthy interpersonal behavior or interactions within a group. Now, I went on the website, looked up dysfunctional family, and the only thing was just a bunch of pictures of my family, so I wasn't sure <laughs> what to do with that. Um, and that's a joke to my parents who are watching. Okay, <laughs> so anyways, we could spend an entire series talking about the idea of dysfunction, truly, but... We are not. We're going to talk about it this morning and then move on. So time and time again, you see examples of dysfunction, not only in our world, but in the scripture. And this morning, our source material for this is a story found in Genesis chapter 29. And so we pick up this particular story after a man named Joseph, sorry, not Joseph, Jacob, has just seen the woman of his dreams, Rachel. Okay, so we, leading into the scene, Rachel is bringing Jacob to her father Laban, and we pick it up in verse 14. It says, after Jacob had stayed with Laban for about a month, Laban said to him, you shouldn't work for me without pay just because we're relatives. Tell me how much your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The older daughter 
was named Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. There was no sparkle in Leah's eye, but Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Since Jacob was in love with Rachel, he told her father, I will work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. Agreed, Laban replied. I'd rather give her to you than to anyone else. Stay and work with me. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel, but his love for her was so strong that it seemed to be but a few days. Now Jacob had just made a pretty significant offer to Laban in exchange for his daughter's hand in marriage. I will work for you tirelessly for seven years. Now there's a lot of complexities and customs and culture from back then that I'll go ahead and let pastor talk about when he preaches through Genesis. We're not going to get lost in that this morning. So we arrive at the end of a seven-year deal, the wedding feast, and finally Laban is bringing Rachel to Jacob to be married. But apparently it was dark and he failed to realize that who had actually been brought to him was Leah until the morning after the wedding. So again, culture, dysfunction, things that pastor are going to talk about when he goes through Genesis. <laughs> so Jacob is furious, obviously, with Laban. And Laban says that if you work for me another seven years, I'll give you Rachel this time. Like, I'm sorry, no, no deal. But Jacob agrees. And again, two wives, customs, culture, pastor, okay? We're just going just gonna to shove that over there. So this brings us to our first point in the morning. Dysfunction begins at an individual level. Dysfunction begins at an individual level. Labels dysfunction and deception is starting with, while it's customary for the oldest daughter to get married first, he knew Jacob's love for Rachel. It was clear that he obviously had eyes for Rachel and not Leah. But he knew if I pull a little switcheroo and give her him Leah, he's so in love with Rachel, I can get another seven years of work out of this guy. And obviously, God was blessing Jacob. God still worked through this conflict, but he saw the, the blessing that he received through Jacob's work, so he's like, I need seven more years of that. So this is a plan that was molded over, and, and he began to create, but it's dysfunctional. He took advantage of the situation, but Jacob isn't completely innocent either, okay? If we look back just two chapters in Genesis, we see something oddly similar in Genesis 27. So Jacob has a twin brother named Esau, okay? And Esau was the firstborn son, and the Bible says that when he was born, Jacob was clasping his ankle as he came out of the womb, okay? So this begins the lifelong rivalry, starts at day one, okay? Always fighting for, fighting for each other. And Esau, it says, the Bible says he was a skilled hunter and favored by his father. And Jacob was more cunning and favored by his mother, Rebekah which is crazy because we, we, we in the crowd do not have a favorite child. That's just clear, right? I know my siblings may watch this and it's going to be on the internet forever, so I'm not going to say who I think the favorite sibling is, and they'll probably say that it's me. But there was favor between the parents. And at the climax of this story, Esau, as the firstborn, is starving. He comes to Jacob, he's starving, and Jacob is cooking a meal. What, I don't know what he was making, but, but it says a stew. And Jacob or Esau is so hungry... He's like, give me some of that. And Jacob says, give me your birthright and you can have a bowl of stew. And Esau's like, fine, take it. I don't care. I'll take the stew. Now, birthright refers to special privileges or inheritance that is automatically given to the firstborn son. So Esau, given everything that his father has and, and will eventually leave behind, has now just transferred that to Jacob for a bowl of stew. So Jacob, now possessing the birthright, just needs his father's blessings to have the full, the full circle, to, have, to basically have it all. So he tricks his father with the help of his mom. We'll talk more about that later. But at this time, Isaac is blind. So a meal is prepared for, for, uh, for Isaac, and Jacob basically covers his arms with goat skin to basically act more like his brother, talks in a deeper voice, gets some like dirt perfume and puts it on, like just to begin to really sell the whole thing. Goes into his father, receives Esau's blessing, 
that Esau should be getting, Jacob gets it, and he leaves town before anyone can realize. Dysfunction, okay? There are tons of examples of dysfunction going on with every single person involved in this family. It's a family full of dysfunction, but on an individual level. So each person is dealing with some sort of dysfunction. Some of it, if not all of it, would be better to find a sin. Okay, some dysfunction is just dysfunction. Some of it is actually sin. It's easier if we call it dysfunction, but it's actually sin. And everywhere we look in our world, the TV, the internet, news, schools, we see dysfunction. It's all around us. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 through 5, your notes have it wrong because I texted Jamie the wrong verse at like 2 in the morning when I was working on the message. So you'll just have to follow along. Right in there, 6, verses 4 through 5, it says, Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. We all have the responsibility to monitor and work on our own dysfunction, not only for the betterment of our families, but for the betterment of ourselves. Now, this is not solely a marriage issue. So you single people in the crowd, you are not off the hook this morning. This is not simply a marriage issue. It applies to every single person. But for this next section, I'm going to take a moment and focus in on married people. So number two, point number two, married people problems equal single people problems. Married people problems equal single people problems. Now the famous philosopher Will Ferrell said it best. (laughs) Before you marry a person, you should first make them use a computer with slow internet to see who they really are. (laughs) Okay, we've experienced that as a staff over the past couple weeks. No internet. So the idea of married people problems is a bit misleading. Okay, so sure there are times where maybe there's a collective problem with someone in the family, um, and then you call the youth pastor, but most issues in the family are single people problems. Most problems between the spouses occur on an individual level. And when you're single, you may be dealing with certain levels of dysfunction in your own single life, but then you meet someone, you fall in love, and eventually you get married. That dysfunction is usually still there, okay? But we may even be blind to that dysfunction. We may not even know it's there. Only our parents have seen it. But when we get married, we think that either the area will fix itself or that we'll be able to keep it hidden forever. But how many of you married people know that when in fact, typically what happens in marriage is that the things that are not really on the surface level, when you begin to spend time with that one person, they begin to, begins to amplify your thought, your th- flaws. It amplifies them, it doesn't hide them, it brings them to the surface quicker. So I'm gonna give you a vis- visual example here. Um, So to start, I got Katie's permission to talk about us, okay? So as I'm sharing, don't be like, oh, he's going to be in trouble. So I'm going to steal my notes kind of over here. So um, here I have two bowls of ping pong balls, okay? Now, what do the ping pong balls exemplify? These are dysfunction, okay? Individual dysfunctions. And they represent the dysfunction in our personal lives. So uh, this is mine. We'll do this. <laughs> this is Katie's, okay? Obviously, there's a little more going on here than there is here, okay? So we have these dysfunctions on an individual level, but then you get married and you combine them. Now, men, take notes. I'm not going to name Katie's dysfunction. I'm just going to add them, okay? It's the smart thing to do. But... I'm going to name mine. So when I first got married, some low self-esteem, some, uh, let's see, what else did I write? Some low communication skills. We'll put two in for that one. Um, Let's see. Yeah, no experience with raising little kids. That's three. Um, Family of origin, the way my parents raised me, that's three. And not a super strong leader, so we'll just go like that. (laughs) So that's my dysfunction and Katie's dysfunction. Now we're married. Now these are collected, okay? 
So you may be in the similar situation, but it may be different. Maybe it's boredom. Maybe it's issues with pr- past intimate relationships. Maybe it's money, infidelity, jealousy, trust, fear of conflict, differing values, keeping score, trauma, or harmful behaviors. It could be any, any one of these things. And as I add a little bit of water, let's see, which one do I want to use first? As we add a little bit of water, nothing happens, right? This is what we call the honeymoon phase. Nothing's happened. Okay, but over time, spend more time married, right? Let's count how many of these I have. Okay, you go through things. You're, you're, the, t- the water is representing life spent together. Let's pause there. Things are going pretty well, so you add kids to the mix. <laughs> and last but not least, as you live more life, inevitably, what was once submerged rises to the surface. And now you're left with a mess. So these dysfunctions that used to be way down here are now all over my table and right here at the surface. You can no longer avoid that dysfunction. Now, if we look at this as married people problems, we're just left with a mess. We're like, okay, so who, fix, who fixes what? How do we handle this? How do we get rid of this mess? How do we like, can we push those back down? No, okay. Um, what do we do? Like, how do we make those disappear? And the issue is when we're left with this, we either revert to that dysfunction and live in it, or we take it upon ourselves to fix the other person. <laughs> right? Because obviously Tyler is not represented in this. He's represented here, right? Nothing. No, we try and fix the other person. And the whole point of this series is to look to ancient wisdom and see what it would have to say about our families. And we need to learn to look at scripture for a way out of this mess that many people are stuck in, both in this room and outside of this room. So how do we fix this? How do we work on this? The first thing is commit to working on it together. Commit to working on it together. The first step to working on this together is to realize that it's not up to you, just you or your spouse to fix this. If you're single and you're still dealing on the bowl level, it's not up to you to fix that. Realize that Christ is in the mix as well. In fact, he should be the only person in the mix. He knows that we don't, we can't figure out this situation on our own, but can give us the skills and the gifts to work through it. And this seems hard because maybe not even, you don't even know where to start, right? You've hit levels of dysfunction in your own relationship, and you're probably even thinking of them right now, and you're like, we don't even know what to do. You just want to sit on the floor and cry because you're like, what? Who did I marry? Or who, who am I, right? One of the two. It seems hard because we may not even know where to start. The first thing you can do is get on the same page. You and your spouse can get on the same page, okay? And if you're on the same page, you and your spouse agree, awesome. Inevitably, you will not agree. That's okay. You can still move forward. You can still move forward. The next step is to own what is yours, What if this spillover of dysfunction is mine? What if this spillover is is my sin? What areas over here are mine to take ownership of? This is a step to take an inventory. The point is to identify what you need to work on. And the point is not, uh, the point of this is not to um, point at or throw shade at your spouse's dysfunction. Right? You're like, okay, let's, let's make a list together. Let's start with yours, honey. We'll make your list first. <laughs> right? No. That's, <laughs> that's not going to work. And you'll end up in pastor's office talking about it later. <laughs> your job is not to blame the person or make the list for them. Make your own list. Keep track of your own dysfunction. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through 5 says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye? 
when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The point I'm making is to take responsibility for your own stuff. And if you're married and you've done the hard work and you have a healthy way of communicating through this stuff, those of you that have been married longer than I have, that's awesome. You can talk about these things openly, great. All you need to do is make a list. For those of you that even, even the fact that I'm preaching about this right now, you're like, I don't want to leave this room. Because after I leave this room, I get in the car and then conversations start. And I don't want to have those conversations. Okay? I feel for you. I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> the desired out outcome of this exercise would be for you both to come together with your lists. Wait for it and commit them to Christ. Not to come together with their list and say, honey, yours seems a little bit incomplete. Okay? <laughs> the Lord will do that work for you, so don't put your foot in your mouth. God will convict. God will work on that. He uses this thing called the Holy Spirit. The last thing is to work to encourage one another. Work to encourage one another. If correction is necessary, it has to, without a doubt, come in love. You should consider being prayerful about it if you're going to convict, if, if you're going to bring something up and committing it to Christ and asking the Holy Spirit to be with you, not only for the receiver of the correction, but in you, and that it would work out for the betterment of your marriage. That God would convict you individually before anything else. Now notice when you can the areas your partner is working on and encourage them. Say, hey, I know you've been saying that you're, one of your dysfunctions is that you're really short with the kids. I saw how you interacted with that. That was awesome. Good job. High five each other in the kitchen. Move on, right? Encouragement is good. So number three, dysfunction unchecked gets passed on. This is where I put my youth pastor hat on. So let's look back at the story of Jacob, and we're going to read what actually happened in this situation with his dad, Isaac. So one day when Isaac was old and turning blind, he called for Esau, the, his older, brother, older son, and said, Son, yes, father, Esau replied, I am an old man now, Isaac said, and I don't know when I may die. Take your bow and a quiver full of ar arrows and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare my favorite dish and bring it here for me to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. But Rebekah overheard what Isaac had said to his son Esau. Rebekah's the mom. So when Esau left for the hunt, left to hunt for the wild game, she said to her son Jacob, Listen, I overheard your father say to Esau, Bring me some wild game and prepare me a delicious meal. Then I'll bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me. Do exactly as I tell you. Go out to the flocks and bring me two fine young goats. I'll use them to prepare your father's favorite dish. Then take the food to your father so he can eat it and bless you before he dies. But look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, my brother Esau is a hairy man and my skin is smooth. What if my father touches me? He'll see that I am trying to trick him and then he'll curse me instead of blessing me. But his mother replied, then let the curse fall on me, my son, just do what I tell you. Jacob's mom is orchestrating this madness. Okay? Jacob has already played part in it, right? He already stole his brother's birthright for a bowl of stew. But his mom is helping him finish it off. Then it gets passed to Jacob, this dysfunction. Then Jacob, two wives later, and two concubine wives later, again, Genesis pastor. We have kids, okay? There's kids enter the scenario. Counting the kids delivered by Leah, both Leah and her servant, we have eight sons, okay? I think there's a daughter in there, but there's eight sons. And then counting the boys delivered by Rachel and her servant, there's four sons. The dysfunction in Jacob and Leah and Rachel led to bitter consequences for the kids. Jacob receiving dysfunction passed down from his mom. Rachel and Leah dysfunction down from Laban, their father. Now it was common for the boys of Leah's side and Rachel's side to have anger, resentment, and jealousy for one another. 
And historically speaking, the worst fighting and rivalry happened between Leah's kids and Rachel's kids. They fought each other from this side to this side. And this list of boys that goes on that they are the representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel. And again, the fighting continues between Rachel's kids and Leah's kids. The dysfunction follows the divide all the way down. And if Jacob and Leah and Rachel had stopped to identify the dif- dysfunction, they were, they were, sorry, if Jacob and Leah and Rachel would have stopped to identify the dysfunction they were operating in that had been passed down from their parents. Or even better, if their parents, if Rebecca and Laban, Laban would have caught and stopped their own dysfunction and turned to God for help, this could have literally changed the entire landscape for the people of Israel, past, present, and future. It could have changed everything. But I want to read an excerpt from, from a message that pastor mentioned last week, a guy named Craig Rochelle. Apparently, we like the same source. He's a pastor of Life Church, and he says this in a parenting series. Okay? If we are not serious about our faith in Jesus, if we're not modeling sincere pursuit of living our lives for the glory, uh, for the glory of Jesus, how can we ever expect our child to do that? If the truth isn't in our hearts, how can we impress it upon our children? Because remember, when it comes to parenting again, especially in the early years, more is caught than is taught. That's a fill-in. They're watching what we do. In fact, I would remind you that our children don't just become what we say, they become what they see. That is scary. If you haven't had kids yet, let that soak in. You'll wait a little while longer. If you've got them, let's go. So what hope do we have? This has been really encouraging, Tyler, just telling us all the dysfunction we have. What is the hope? How do, what, do I, what do I hold on to? What do I do if I've noticed my own dysfunction, whether I'm single or married? <clears throat> or maybe right now, things are good. Marriage is good. own strength, and most of us do, because I know I do, in the famous words of Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? (laughs) Recognize that as it comes to your need, your needed changes, or that, that of your spouse, you're not in control. You're not. You're not in control. But God is. God is in control. God needs to be the focus. Not you, not your spouse, not your career, not your family, not your kids. God needs to be the focus. Now we, we rely on a verse so much so that I have it touched on my wrist, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you a future and a hope. But many of us don't know the context, including myself, until I got the tattoo of what's actually happening then and there. So you're most, most of us are familiar with that verse, but do you know what's actually going on in the story? Israel is being held captive in exile in Babylon, okay? They are captured, captured they are living in Babylon, and, and the Israelites in charge are telling them, God is going to rescue us. Don't set roots down. Have a backpack ready to go. God's going to come rescue us from this. It's just a mis- misunderstanding from heaven. We'll be fine. God's going to come get us. He's going to destroy all these Babylonians, and we're going to be fine. But God, speaking through Jeremiah, his prophet, delivers a little bit of a different message. Verse 10 says, this is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. And I'll bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me, you will, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. But we want verse 11 only. We want, we want that good desires, the plans. 
So in the Israel of sorrow, in their grief, in their pain, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. We as Christians need to return to or for the first time go to a dependency on our Savior, Jesus Christ. You cannot fix it. You cannot fix you. You cannot fix your spouse. Only God can. You need to call on the Holy Spirit for your marriage and for your relationships. John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17 say, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, because, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. The world cannot receive him. But so often we turn to people and books and TikToks and Instagram reels for inspiration, for something new, for some, some companionship to know like, am I the only person that lost it on my kids this morning? No, you're in, a, you're in a host of people, right? You're like, okay, yeah, I need to, okay, yeah, I can try that. Some of us will even listen to other pastors' messages before we go to the feet of Jesus. Why is that? Why do we do that? Because ultimately, I think we can feel like we can get a faster result if we go to those things as opposed to just sitting at Jesus' feet, broken, just saying, I don't even know. Here you go, God. There it is. I, don't, I can't hold it together anymore. I can't fix it. I need you to fix it. And those things aren't bad in of themselves. I'm not saying to delete Instagram, to not talk to your family, to not talk to friends, to not listen to pastor's messages. But we need to get back to our Savior's feet with this stuff. He created us and knows how we work. Why aren't we going to him to fix it? The second thing is pray for yourself, your spouse, your marriage, and your children. We need to pray as though we expect God to supernaturally intervene in our circumstances. How would your prayer life change if you truly believed that he not only cares about your needs, but he has the ability to supernaturally intercede on your behalf? Do we know that to be true? Do we? And do we act like it? I think my, I even know that if I, if, if my prayer life, if I'm not focusing on that and realizing that, my prayer life is a little dim. God, if, if, if it's in your will, I'd ask that you'd heal my family member. No, God, I believe that by the blood you shed on the cross that you are going to heal that family member. Whether you use a, a, a spiritual interaction or you use the specific doctor that knows how to fix it, that you can do that. How would our prayer life change? When your marriage vows are being tested and you're trying, you're crying out to God, he hears you. He hears you, but you need to fight back against what the enemy is trying to tear apart. Isaiah chapter 64, verse four through five say, for since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. And James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So the last thing that we can do is we can seek help. Start at Jesus' feet, okay? Don't go to step three before step one. Start at Jesus' feet, but then you can seek help. And it's fair to say that the majority of the people in your neighborhood at your work, at your schools, at the extracurricular activities that your kids are involved in, don't look. But even sitting next to you right now, don't look. Shame on some of you guys. You just can't stop. That they are either currently or have struggled with sin and dysfunction in their own lives and in their relationships. This is not something that we're set free. This is not something that is not, like, that does not hit every single person in this room. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 12 say, Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and, uh, affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. 
We walk around with this unreal pressure to present ourselves as put together and thriving at all times, right? We have this social media influence of like, everything's great. Look at this beautiful meal I just had. Look at my kids behaving. They were just fighting each other two seconds ago, but I caught this second photo where they're loving each other. Right, have you seen the movie Encanto? I'm in this Disney phase where all my kids watch is Disney. The movie Encanto, the entire town bases their well-being on how the Madrigal family is doing. And from the surface, it looks great. But if you go behind the walls, fractures everywhere. Perfect from the outside, but fractured inside. Successful Christian marriages and healthy Christians are grounded in spirit-filled, worshiping communities. That's why we need to be here. This is not so we feel good speaking to a full room. It's so we, because we know what's happening before this and after this. Draw support from this place. Draw support from this church. Identify someone you know or someone in your life group who cares about you and your spouse and use them as a resource to walk alongside you and find someone who's been married longer than you have. Don't look to Katie and I because we'll just remind you of what it was, right? Right? The next thing we're, I, this, I'm going to say it. It's in my notes, so I'm going to say it. Go to counseling. Go to counseling, okay? There, for so long, it's been taboo to go to someone for help. We need to act like we have it all together. And when you go to counseling, go to a Christian counseling. There's nothing bad about counseling. And you may say, uh, well, they're going to, if, if someone sees me in front of this office, they're going to be like, well, you obviously must be messed up because you're in counseling with your wife. It's like, no, I just want a better relationship. So I'm in counseling. I just want better relationships. So I surround myself with people that are, yeah, further along than me, but they've learned some of these lessons that I don't know yet. Instead of thinking about what people are going to think, think about what you're, what you are modeling for your children. Think about what you're modeling for other people in your life that are desperate and trying to figure something out for themselves, their relationship. I knew things changed when my parents started going to counseling. There was the before and then there was the after. Yeah, it didn't fix things right away, but I knew. I'm like, okay, mom and dad are going for help. That means that if I'm ever in a situation like that, I need to go for help. This, this counseling is going to give you the skill set you don't currently have to walk towards health and healing. And can I challenge you, if you're single in the room, do not marry someone that is not willing to go to premarital counseling with you. And don't go to premarital counseling that's going to be easy. Go to someone that's going to be hard. Go to someone that's going to challenge your relationship before it's committed to marriage. I went to some pretty easy premarital counseling. But anyone that approaches Katie and I, previous students that we've walked through, we're like, this is going to be hard, and you are going to argue. But that's good. You're working towards health and healing. And as we close, Martin and the team are going to come up I want to encourage you, there's people on either side of the auditorium that would love to pray with you, either you or, or your spouse, you and your spouse. And maybe you need to pray on your own while they lead us in worship. Or maybe you and your spouse need prayer and you're going to go to someone on the sides. Or maybe you just sit, you and your spouse sit and you just pray as they start this song. But most importantly, the, if you don't take anything else from, from what I'm saying this morning, you have to seek God in dysfunction. You have to. It's the only hope that we have to, to move towards health and healing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, grateful for the fact that you have provided us this ancient wisdom, God, to, to lean on in times where we don't really know where to go and what to work on and, and how, to, how to work forward. So God, we ask that for those in the room that are, things are good, God, we just ask that you would allow them to lock some of this wisdom away. God, that as they move forward into uh, the future, God, that if they do inevitably, and they will, inevitably will, hit moments of dysfunction, God, that they would be able to rely on your ancient wisdom for help. God, I pray for the couples in the room that um, things aren't great and they need to work through dysfunction. God, I pray that they would seek you in it. God, that they would lean on you, that they, they each would lean on you. And God, I pray for the couples that are really far off, that are, that are like 
moments away from finding either a result or finding someone different. God, I pray that they would cling to their wife, cling to their husband. God, I pray that they would, they would find that the, the issues that they're dealing with are not only internal in themselves, but in their spouse as well, and that if they lean on you, if they commit these things that they're struggling with to you, God, that they can find supernatural intervention on your behalf. God, I just ask that even for the single people in the room, God, that they would begin to identify areas of dysfunction in their lives and that they would be able to work on it and figure it out, Lord, and at least be in a healthier spot before they move into marriage. God, please be in the midst of our families at this church. Let us, let us be a church that, that fights for one another and prays for one another. God, it's in your name we pray these things. So as Pastor Tyler shares that, and we have, like he said, we have people ready to pray. You're welcome to head over for that. What a good word for us to hear, right? But really, it comes down to our connection with Jesus. And so, as we sing this song, we consider the perfect example. It's not what we make up. It's not what ever we think is perfect. It's about what God has shown us as his example. Let's sing this together. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but we've heard the whisper of love.
seeking him and we encourage everybody to continue to do that through the week connect with each other make sure that you continue to seek the Lord each day and for those of you who are newer to our church if you want to if you want to take a minute and head over to the cafe we have our tech take 10 with Pastor Gary and the rest of the staff you can get to know everybody there and get to meet each other have a good rest of your Sunday we'll see you next week